it is a special day where we get to take time and honor people in our lives who are our moms, our grandmothers, uh, our sisters, those women in our life. Really, this day is specifically called Mother's Day, but today we, we give thanks for the ways in which God works through women in our lives in unique and important in special ways. I had to watch this like three times so I could get up here without crying to, to lead us in a time of prayer. Uh, but if you're a woman in here, would you please stand and uh, let's give them a round of applause. Please stand, all the women here. Girls too, come on. <laughs> now, everybody just saw where those women are. You can be seated. And if you're near one of those people, would you reach out your hand towards them or on them? I'm going to lead us in a prayer. This is, from, this is an old prayer from a book of blessings. Let us pray. For our mothers who have given us life and love, that we may show them reverence and love, we pray to the Lord. For mothers who have lost a child through death, that their faith may give them hope, and their family and friends support and console them, we pray to the Lord. For women, though without children of their own, who like mothers have nurtured and cared for us and befriended us, we pray to the Lord. For mothers who have been unable to be a source of strength, who have not responded to their children and have not sustained their families, we pray to the Lord. Loving God, as a mother, as women, give life and nourishment. So watch over us, your church. Bless these women that they may be strengthened as Christians. Let the example of their faith and love shine forth. Grant we, their sons and daughters, may honor them always with the spirit of profound respect and gratitude. Grant this through Christ our Lord, in union with the Holy Spirit. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Happy, happy Mother's Day to all of you all out here. We are glad to be celebrating this with you. Well, I'm going to, we're starting our sermon, or continuing on our sermon series, Messy Spirituality, but I've started something I want us to continue trying for a little bit, so everyone kind of loosen up. Everyone's loose, got those rotator cuffs going, all right? Now open up your arms as wide as you can. It's going to get in some personal space. That's all right. We're all family. Everybody is all in each other's business. Let's pray. Oh, good and gracious God, we stand here, we sit here with our arms open wide because we want you to fill us. We want you to come and speak to us in ways that are beyond our full comprehension, but that change us. God, come, breathe your life here today. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable. In your sight, God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. All right, you can put your hands down. <laughs> We're going to start right out by reading some scripture. I'm going to go to uh, th today's scripture comes from Luke chapter 18, verses 35 through 42. It's Jesus on his way. Look out for two things here. It's Jesus on his way into Jerusalem, which in Luke's gospel, everything's kind of leading towards Jerusalem, right? That's where the culmination of Jesus's ministry would happen in his death and resurrection. So this is getting closer and closer. We're almost there. There's kind of a band of people that are following Jesus now. So that's the first thing to note in this Luke 18 passage. The second thing is that sight is really important in the gospel of Luke. Jesus is always talking about, can you see? Do you see what I'm talking about? See the kingdom of heaven. And this is about a blind man here. So it obviously is important. So here now, this scripture from Luke chapter 18, verses 35 through 42, it says this. As Jesus came to Jericho, a certain blind man was sitting beside the road begging. When the man heard the crowd passing by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus, the Nazarene is passing by. The blind man shouted, Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. Those leading the procession scolded him, telling him to be quiet. But he shouted even louder, Son of David, show me mercy. Jesus stopped and called for the man to be brought to him. When he was present, Jesus asked, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, I want to see. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. At once he was able to see, and he began to follow Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they praised God too. Thanks be to God for this scripture, this scripture that speaks to us in so many different ways. 
<laughs> There's no easy way to do that. I've got to find a better buffer there. But So we're continuing on in this series called Messy Spirituality. Uh, I've, I've told you before, I'm blatantly ripping the title of this book or of this book for our series. It's Messy Spirituality, God's Annoying Love for Imperfect People, How God Just Keeps on Loving Us Over and Over. Last week, I started this series by saying that this is a series for those of us who don't feel like we are enough. We don't pray enough. We don't believe enough. We don't trust enough. We don't read our Bible enough. We don't come to church enough. We don't give enough. All these things, we don't love God enough. And Michael Iaconelli says, this book, this series is just for you because God has this fondness, this habit of drawing in people who sort of didn't have their acts together, who considered by some people as not enough, weren't good enough, not ready. He, Iaconelli says he wrote this book for the silent majority of us who have con- been convinced that we just don't do Christianity right. He suggests that our imperfection, unfinishedness, and messiness are our, all, in fact, the earmarks of true Christianity. I love that. I hear true earmarks of Christianity is how much you read, how devout, and how faithful, and those are things too. But he says on the honest journey, our imperfection, unfinishedness, and our messiness are earmarks of true Christianity. Over and over throughout this week and next week as we continue on in the series, I hope you hear the message of your acceptability. I hope you hear the message over and over that when you come just as you are, God loves you just as you are. God accepts you. God calls you worthy. God calls you sacred. I hope you hear that over and over, the unending and nothing you can do about it kind of love. Just like in the baptism, before Sloan could even choose to have God's love, God's already chosen her. It's the same for us. God's already chosen us. I want to look uh, today at our passage from Luke and explore one way we might begin to feel God's presence in the messiness of our unpredictable lives. So I'm going to go through this passage verse by verse, which isn't something I often do, but hopefully we can get some meat out of it, see how it might open up for us or speak to us and tell us about our love or our acceptability before God. So let's look at it again. The first two verses I want to look at is Jesus coming into Jericho, and there's this blind guy. Verse 36 through 38 when, he heard, when the man heard the crowd passing by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus the Nazarene is passing by. That's important. The crowd that was there with Jesus, they called him Jesus the Nazarene. That's where he's from, so they're not wrong, right? Well, verse 38, it says, the blind man shouted, Jesus, son of David. Wait, he got that wrong. Jesus the Nazarene was passing by, and he said, Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. Right from the get guy, we, we see this guy. Remember, I told you sight is important in Luke we see this blind man who can't physically see, but already is seeing that Jesus is something different. You see, Jesus the Nazarene talks about where he's from. Jesus, son of David, talks about Jesus' messianic promise, how Jesus is the Messiah for us. Maybe this blind man had heard about Jesus somewhere or somehow, but he knows who to call Jesus. He knows that Jesus has come for a deeper, more meaningful, more important thing, not just talking about where he's from, but who he is, son of David, our Savior, the Messiah. Show me mercy. Verse 39, it goes on, those leading the procession scolded him. Man, that's rough to read, isn't it, right? Here, a couple thousand years later, those leading the procession scolded him, telling him to be quiet. You know, as we think about our imperfections and how sometimes that makes us feel not worthy or not good enough or not a good enough Christian, it's people like me with the microphone, the leaders of the procession, the religious institution that has uh, given you this message of your unacceptability, of if you don't do this X, Y, and Z just like this, if you don't jump through this hoop, if you don't look just so, if you don't practice just so, well, then you're not worthy. If you're not part of this procession, you know, a blind man would have kind of been considered towards the margins. He would have been a beggar. He wouldn't have been fully included in a lot of ways, most likely in the community. So the leaders in that community, probably the religious leaders like myself, told him, just be quiet. You're not doing it right. You don't look like the rest of us. You don't sound like the rest of us. But what does he do? It says, he shouted even louder, son of David, show me mercy. I love that. Verse 40, Jesus stopped and called for the man to be brought to him. Man, 
I love that for our lives. Think about what that, you know, when you read scripture, you, we pray first of all, and then we ask the Holy Spirit to speak into it and make it come alive to us. Think about that for your own life. This idea that this blind man, being ignored by the leaders of that day, told him to be quiet. He shouts even louder. And Jesus, in the middle of this busy procession, there would have been who knows how many people, but it would have been loud. It would have been raucous people getting excited. Jesus hears one little call and stops the whole thing. Here's one call calling out of their imperfection in the minds of the religious elite or the leaders of the ceremony. He hears them call, and he stops it all because it's worth it to him. And he brings them over to him, and he asks them, what do you want me to do for you? Mm. What do you want me to do for you? I don't think that's a question that we think God asks us very often. It is important, I think, for us to live faithful lives as servants, as we often call it, of Christ, to go out into the world and share the good news and be benevolent, be generous, be uh, kind to people around us. That absolutely is important in what God calls us to do. At the same time, God is calling to us, what do you want me to do for you? I feel like I so rarely think about that in my life, that God is asking me in the middle of a crowd when I'm calling out of my imperfection, Cole, brother, sister, what do you want me to do for you? It goes on that he says, I want to see, Lord, I want to see. Jesus said, receive your sight, your faith has healed you. At once he was able to see, and he began to follow Jesus, praising God when all the people saw it, they praised God too. I want to encourage you. I titled today's sermon. I stole it from Mike Iaconelli's book. I told you he's just writing the whole sermon series for me. So if you don't like it, blame him. Write letters to him. But uh, I want to encourage you today that when something or someone makes you feel like I'm doing God wrong, has anyone ever felt that way? You don't have to raise your hand. Has anyone ever felt that way though? Like I must be doing God wrong. You've been lied to. It's just not true. God takes us exactly as we are. And when we authentically come before God, there is nothing that it has to look like. We just get to come and be with God, imperfect as we are, and God accepts us and loves us. Iaconelli, he says, I'm all for getting the mechanics right. It's important to do these spiritual practices, but spiritual growth is more than a procedure. It's a wild search. Listen to this. I love this. Spiritual growth is more than a procedure. It's a wild search for God in the tangled jungles of our souls, a search which involves a volatile mix of messy reality, wild freedom, frustrating stickiness, increasing slowness, and a healthy dose of gratitude. The point is, if you haven't already heard it, there are so many different ways God invites us into real, powerful, life-changing encounters with the living God every single day, inviting you into it every day. What's required on our end is our vulnerability and our authentic presence before God. God requires your authentic, real, messed up, not always clean, not always perfect presence before God. Now, when I started saying that, I started just skipping right over that, but I was like, okay, hold on now, preach. What does really authentic presence mean? What, is, what am I really talking about here? What does it really mean to be present with the God of all the cosmos, the God of no beginning or no end, the God who's beyond time and place, this huge, massive, major thing, this God? How do we really authentically get present with God? I think a place to start might be where Jesus uh, where we see Jesus starting in our passage. Instead of putting ourselves in the blind man's shoes, we put ourselves in Christ's shoes and see that Jesus went out of his way to love the unlovely, to love the unclean, to love the untouchable. So maybe we should start there too. The leaders in that time thought that uh, blindness was caused by a family sin. So if a child was born blind, they would have been like, yeah, okay, that's because your parents are a bunch of sinners. Or if you turn blind, it's because you've done something wrong, so you're getting your dues here is kind of what they thought. They considered him unclean, unfit for much more than begging on the edge of a street. And how often have we been told that same story? How often have we heard the message of faith to be exclusively and only, although it's part of it, we, all we ever hear sometimes is we are sinners. No, really, you are sinners. And just always getting it wrong. 
When there is pain and suffering in our life, it's because we haven't done something enough. We haven't prayed enough. We haven't read enough. We haven't given enough. We are getting what is owed to us. But Jesus saw this man, someone the world and religious had told the story of his unworthiness. Jesus saw him and gave him nothing but love, acceptance, his own presence, and healing. Authentic presence begins with an authentic faith. It doesn't have to pretend or always be consistent, but presence begins with our belief that God cares for you without ending. That God cares for the unlovely, the lowly, even us. Authentic presence begins with the willingness to love ourselves and others right where we are. I'm going to say that again. Authentic presence begins with our willingness just an attitude that I'm going to love myself and I'm going to love every single person I come in contact, no matter who they are, what they've done, what they look like. That's what authentic presence looks like. Doug Webster, he wrote a book called The Easy Yoke, and Iaconelli talks about him a little bit. He tells the story of an idealistic college student who uh, was like a sophomore in college, and this guy, before he went to school, didn't know God. He didn't have a, a relationship. He wasn't a Christian, but in college, he got involved in campus ministry and gave his life to God. He became a Christian, and he was so fired up that he decided he was going to spend his summer on an urban missions trip. So this young man, he goes to a really rough part of Philadelphia. Philadelphia, a really impoverished, high, uh, high crime rate. And he goes into this area and he just walks into the nearest apartment he can find and just starts knocking on doors. He's just so fired up about God. He just wants to tell everybody about his experience and about how much God loves them too. So he's knocking on doors and it's not going great, but uh, Doug tells this one story. I don't know Doug. I'm not sure why I called him that. Mr. Webster, the author, Doug Webster tells the story uh, <laughs> that he knocks on this one door and this lady answers the door with the cigarette in her mouth and a naked baby in her hand. And he just jumps right into his shtick, just telling him, do you know who Jesus is? And just starting to tell him good things, but this lady doesn't know him, and she just kind of slams the door in his face. So this young man goes outside, and he sits on the curb and just sort of weeps. He thinks, God, why does this woman, why do these people not want to know about who you are and what you've done in my life? You've changed my life. How come they don't want to hear that? And then he remembered, Webster says, he remembers that that woman who was smoking the cigarette with the naked baby, that her baby was naked. So he goes to the local market just down the street and he buys a, <laughs> buys a pack of cigarettes, which are not good, Iaconelli says, right? Buys a pack of cigarettes and he uh, buys a box of diapers for her and he goes back up to the door and he knocks on the door and he says, hey, look, I've got you these things. She's sort of surprised. She lets him in, though. And he says, I ended up staying for hours playing with this baby and, and giving him a diaper. It's the first clean diaper the mom said she had had in a week, right? And just hanging out with them while she was in there smoking. And he was just sort of playing with the baby in an unclean sort of environment. Eventually, a couple hours later, the woman asked, why are you doing this for me? Why are you even here? And in that moment, then he was able to share his faith. Then he was able to say, I just saw that you needed something and I wanted to help any way I can and just make sure that you know how much God loves you. See, the point of the story is he had been told and read about and heard all the books and the sermons and all those sort of things, heard about God, and this woman might have too, but until she experienced God through generosity, love, and presence, she wasn't willing to accept it. After the young man told her his story, she looks at him and asks, pray for me and my baby that we can make it out of here alive. So he did. That young man that day, he learned a powerful lesson that I keep on having to learn over and over and over. I can read, study, talk about God. Oftentimes I get paid to do it, right? Do all the things that are really good and important, but one moment in God's presence is more powerful than reading a library full of the best books written about God. One moment in God's presence is more powerful than everything we know or think we know about Christianity. One half second authentically, vulnerably, really sitting before God, who spoke life over to us before we were even a thought in the world, changes everything. 
And a moment with God can look like this here today. I hope it feels like a moment of God to you at some point today, but it can also look really non-churchy. It can also look really messy. It can also feel out of place or even just wrong, like sitting with a stranger and her baby while she smokes or yelling out above the crowds who are telling you to be quiet, blind man, while Jesus is coming by. I wonder what one moment with God looks like in your life. It's not something I can answer for you, but I have this strange, deep hope within me that you feel that longing, that you feel that stirring of God calling you into God's presence, that you sense God is near and is inviting you into something deep and real and authentic and messy and beautiful. In a day and age where our culture prioritizes doing, producing, making, efficiency, posting, publishing, more, 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 God is simply asking to be with us. That's what God's asking from you today, is just to be with God, honestly, vulnerably. Makes me think of that passage from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. It says this, Come to me, all you who are struggling hard, and carrying heavy loads. This is Jesus talking to us today. Come to me, all you who are struggling hard and carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Put on my yoke and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble, and you will find rest for yourselves. My yoke is easy to bear, and my burden is light. Hmm band as you guys start to make your ways forward, please. I'm convinced of this, that any time we make any effort, imperfect, small, the, the smallest little thing, any time we make any effort coming to church to be in the presence of God, God is willing to find us right where we are, right in the midst of our tossing and turning, right in the midst of our struggle and pain, right in the midst of our messiness, and ask us to sit and take God's burden, take God's yoke, which is rest, which is light. God gives us love, gives us hope, gives us exactly what we need in that moment, and it changes everything. The song we're about to sing here in just a second, Reckless Love, it's one I've been, as I've been praying through today's service and praying for you, it's one I've just been allowing to pour over me. It's just been speaking to me all morning. Feel God inviting you tenderly and without judgment into a time of rest and love. And as we're coming to God, God is recklessly coming to us. The next time someone or something tells you that you're doing it all wrong, that you're doing God all wrong, makes you feel that way, remember that God's love is reckless. It chases us down. It can't be earned. It's never-ending. God is recklessly in pursuit of you. Why? I hope you know the answer to that already. Why is God pursuing us? Why is God pursuing you? Because sister, brother, you are precious. You are beautiful. You are worthy. You are enough for God. Exactly as you find yourself here today, God's saying yes to you. God's asking you to come to God's self. Give God everything you've got right now as we sing this next song and trust that as we go to meet God, God's already right there waiting for us. Praise be to God.